As we celebrate the people who do this work, we will also share joy and laughter. And there is no better place to start than by introducing someone who may make you feel all of the above. Humorous, author, comedian, podcaster, a regular panelist on NPR's Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, and the first woman to host the White House Correspondents' Dinner, please give a very warm welcome to our host, Paula Panston. that's going to make you mad and sad. It's just a special place to be. Uh, you know, I don't want to drown you in politics tonight, but I do want to ask, how many people here, when you saw the picture of the boxes of uh, uh, secret material in Trump's bathroom, Felt better about your own homes. How many people? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, me too. I was uh, almost late tonight because I was watching uh, Trump's TED talk about the Battle of Gettysburg. <laughs> Did y'all hear what he said about the Battle of Gettysburg? <laughs> All right. He said, and I quote, Gettysburg. He was in Gettysburg when he said it, so he had to act like he had read up on Gettysburg before he got there. He said, Gettysburg, what an unbelievable battle that was. <laughs> what an unbelievable, I mean, it was so much and so interesting and so vicious and horrible and so beautiful in many different ways. Don't ask him the follow-up questions. Uh, Say that again about oh about there were good people on both sides. Yeah. Apparently you have the home version of this game. I feel bad. I, it's not like I know that much about the Battle of Gettysburg, but uh, uh, it, uh, therefore I wouldn't speak about it. I guess that's how I would address it. Uh, but I guess when he was there, he felt like he had to say something. Uh, I feel bad for kids now studying history because it's so much longer than when we were kids. <laughs> Remember when my, this is years ago, my middle daughter was doing homework one night and she asked me a question about Watergate. And, uh, a, 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 and, and I said, is that for your current events class? And she said, no, it's history. I said, it is not. <laughs> Seems like just yesterday, doesn't it? Well, it's, uh, it's always kind of weird, like you all are, I feel bad because you're, you're eating, you, you want to eat, but at the same time, I do like to know, like the guy who said, good people on both sides. Uh, uh, how are you involved in this event, sir? Oh, was it Sister Helen? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you know what? She, she threw you right under the bus. As soon as she said it, she like ducked and I didn't even see her. How are you, Sister Helen? Oh, you were augmenting what I was saying? Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, the night that we met, which is many years ago now, we were doing an event for Death Penalty Focus. Do you recall? It was up in Northern California somewhere. Do you remember that? It was in somebody's home. And uh, we were in separate cars, so I didn't meet you until we got to the person's home. But the car that I was in, we all, I think we flew up there, I guess. And, uh, and we all were met by a car, we got into different cars. And I was in the car with uh, Loretta Swit. I don't, I don't think Mike was in our car. Um, and I can't remember, a couple other people. And we don't know where we're going, but the driver was supposed to know where we're going. And, and uh, we go obviously into like a residential neighborhood. And he's slowing down, trying to look for the addresses. And uh, I don't think, what happened was, I think he got distracted, uh, and maybe so did we, but by, we were real near where we were supposed to be. And um, there was a house that had the, the little paper bag lights, right, going up the walkway. And so we were like, yeah, this is it. Okay, yeah, this is it. And we all get out of the car, and we follow the paper bag lights, and it could, we go around to the back of this house because that's the way the paper bag lights took us. And we went in to, and the door was open, and we go into a house, and there was like a couple in 
there doing their laundry or something. <laughs> and they were just stunned. And we were like, we're supposed to go to this thing. Can you imagine just be doing your laundry and Loretta Sweat walks in, flanked by a bunch of people that insist they're supposed to be there? Um, the other thing I remember that about that night, uh, Sister Helen Virgin, is that I had said in my remarks uh, that I am an atheist, and that when you went up, you said, do you remember this? The first thing you said, because I spoke before you did, and the first thing you said was, Paula, we have to talk. <laughs> and I want you to know I'm, I'm still an atheist. Uh, I, 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 I'm not, uh, it's, okay, the thing about atheism, because I work the Bible up, and sometimes when I tell the crowd that I'm an atheist, they do get mad at me. Um, and I quickly comfort them with this fact, which is that uh, we atheists, we have, no, we have no mandate to convert anybody. So you all can be whatever you are, we can be what we are, and we're probably going to get along better, you know, than most groups when you think about it. Uh, you're never going to find me on your doorstep on a Saturday morning. <laughs> Ding dong! Just brought this little bank book by, hoping you'd take a look at it. Just here to tell you there is no word. Uh, <laughs> We just don't do that. All right, now she's not even talking to me anymore. That's <laughs> all it took. Here I thought we had a bond. Here I thought we had an atheist and religious bond that was stronger than some of the religious groups together. And you just dump me for a bite of salad? You're kidding. <laughs> it's the pears. I feel the same. I, I, I don't know when you were supposed to eat, but eating comes first. Yeah. I launched it. The, the salad is delicious. The, the pears really uh, uh, attracted me. The thing about a pear, though, you just, I mean, these are good pears, because I already had a slice of, of, of one. But I'm a junk food eater. I eat green dings. Anybody here from the East Coast? Drake's products, right? The best. Uh, ring dings, yodels, funny bones, devil dogs, sure. And, and then when I first I ended up in California. I didn't plan on coming to California. I fell asleep on a Greyhound bus, and here I am. Uh, and I went to a store looking for ring dings, and they didn't have them. And I tried to ask people about them, and they go, oh, you mean ding-dongs. Okay, those are fighting words, right? When people try to pretend that Hostess could somehow uh, be the equivalent to a Drake's product, of course not. And what I learned is that Drake's are only sold in six states. Did you know that? I know because I followed a delivery truck once. <laughs> what was, would you, okay, the guy over there that said yodels, you, what, how, how are you associated with tonight's event? You're a guest, uh, and a guest of who? Of who? Ed? I can't hear, but the, Ed Redland? Ed Redland from the board, from the board of directors? How do you know the guy who said yodels? He's your agent? He's your agent? Where did you meet? Oh my god. You, um, did, was it an app? <laughs> Just say it. There's no shame in that. Uh, Dad, where did you meet your friend? Okay, can you see that 25 years ago was not aware? <laughs> Filling out a form must be hell for you. <laughs> when was the last time you got a job, Ed? <laughs> this is clearly there. Uh, my, when my son was 16 years old, he was supposedly going to get a job. I don't really think he had any intention of getting a job, but he was supposedly going to. And this was long enough ago that it was before all the online job applications. It was when there were actually paper applications. And he applied to a place called Paquito Moss that was in Santa Monica, where, where we live. It's like a fast food uh, Mexican restaurant. And uh, he, I, I, I don't know, somehow when he started to fill out the form, in fairness to him, he had never done that before. But somehow when he started to fill out the form, he knew nothing about himself. So he had to keep asking me questions. He said, Mom, have I ever worked before? I said, no, honey, not at all. He said, do I have an 
90 degrees. I said, gee, honey, I, 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 I think not knowing if you have a degree is sort of the same as not having a degree. <laughs> And then he was filling out one for Bed Bath & Beyond, which, by the way, I miss so much. Uh, and the Bed Bath & Beyond application was just cruel. It was six pages. It folded out. There were essay questions. And one of the essay questions was, why do you want to work at the Bed Bath & Beyond? Well, that's just mean. Uh, I said to him, I said, I said, you can't tell him the truth. You can't tell him because you don't have enough degrees to sling beans over the Paquito Moss. I said, I don't tell them, because you've always been interested in the beyond. <laughs> I, uh, we were talking about history earlier. I was talking about history earlier. Uh, Helen was eating pears, uh, but I was talking... Well, I was telling you, when that same son was a little, little boy, uh, I was reading him a book that I just picked up. It was, remember that series of, like, kind of picture books with about two lines of text on each page, and they were, and the books were shaped sort of like that. Um, they were paperback, but they were long, uh, and it was, it was, they were books that told you what life was like at a certain point in history. And this one was about the pilgrims that had come, uh, uh, you know, landed in what became Massachusetts. And I grew up in Massachusetts. And so I always thought that they landed at Plymouth. My father used to make us go to Plymouth and look at the rock. He actually had, I swear to you, he bought at the gift shop there a slide of the Plymouth Rock. And on family slide night, remember that? Right? We would have to look at the stupid Plymouth Rock slide. And if we didn't seem excited, he was somehow hurt. So I always believed that that's where the pilgrims landed. And uh, this book tells a story that they landed in Provincetown first, that, on the very tip of the cape first. And then, I don't think they were there for very long. I don't think they even stayed the night before they got back in the boats. How homophobic must they have been? <laughs> it's probably the only history joke you're going to hear tonight. Uh, all right, guys. I, I'm a terrible MC, and I'll tell you why. Well, you probably noticed already, but... I can't remember anything. I can't remember anybody's name. I can't. I, I, we wear name tags in my house. Uh, do you ever do that where you forget somebody's name and then you get to know them too well to ask their name? How awkward is that? That happened with me and my dad. That is. I mean, I would see him in the hallway and I knew I knew him from somewhere. But I just. Uh, um, yeah, there was a point to this. I, I can't remember anything, and that's a problem. And the other thing is I have a very hard time stopping talking, and that is an enormous problem, both as a performer and socially. I mean, no one is happy to get a phone call from me. When I, whenever anybody answers the phone and not call, they always go, oh, Paula. That's kind of that trajectory to it. Um, so one of the many reasons I'm not a good choice for hosting tonight's event is that I have to introduce Mike Farrell. And the truth is, Mike Farrell has been the head of Death Benefit Focus. He's been on the board for years. So you all know Mike much better than I do. I I've been friends with him for years, but I talk a lot, so I honestly barely ever heard him say a word about himself. <laughs> I know that he's uh, long been an advocate for prison reform. I know he's been all over the world fighting for human rights. Uh, but I just, I just today learned that he was on the UN High, he, no, he was the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. I, I think the UN would get a lot further in the struggle if they had a commissioner who wasn't high. That's just one thing I want to say. And by the way, I didn't even know Mike smoked weed. Uh, I, I always use Mike Farrell as an example uh, of someone 
who's used his fame from his considerable talents. And by the way, I, I was not just a fan of MASH. I, I worshipped MASH. Uh, I told you I came here on a Greyhound bus. Uh, I'm from Massachusetts. I took a Greyhound bus around the country when I was 19, I think it was, maybe 20, to see what clubs were like in different cities. I used what was called an Ameripass, which was $150, a blank uh, ticket book, and you could have it filled out for wherever you want. And this is how I made it work. If I wanted to check out a club in Denver, I would take the bus to Denver. I would, when I got off the bus, I would put my stuff in a locker. I would find where was a location four hours away from Denver. I would have a ticket made out to the four hour away place. I would find what was the last trip going there. I would come back, I'd go to the club, I'd come back to the Greyhound bus station, say midnight was the last trip. I would go in, uh, take the bus to the four hour away place and turn around and come right back to Denver. And that's how I got my eight hours sleep every night. And I had no money. And so what I would do is, uh, remember the Greyhound stations years ago had the televisions? And this was at the time when they were showing MASH at 5 o'clock and 5.30 syndicated. With a little bit of money I had, I swear to you, I would sit in those chairs and put the quarters in the television when, when we were in the Greyhound station at 5 or 5.30 so that I could uh, watch uh, MASH. And I know more about it than Mike does. <laughs> I not only know what, how the episode turns out, I know when the characters are going to inhale. I take it very seriously. Anyways, so.